Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. Where there are Sasquatch sightings, that's where we're gonna go. With so many chilling encounters, just waiting to be retold. So join us here in the spooky woods for the Duke Chat Show. with the amazing Blaine Tyler, the foremost <laughs> northern Bigfoot researcher on the planet, now getting into a tight race with Swan Lake Bigfoot's Robert Judd. Yeah. He mysteriously happens to be in northern Ontario. Well, I guess you couldn't hog all the Bigfoot to yourself forever, Blaine. But well, uh, awesome. <laughs> last, last time I got to see Blaine, we were at the uh, Nebraska Bigfoot Conference almost a year ago, and uh, that's what we're here to talk about tonight, actually. We'll give you some updates on of course, Blaine has been doing tons of stuff, and that's included in the movie, too, Inevitably Finding Bigfoot, which documents our little escapades last year at the uh, Nebraska Bigfoot Conference, actually leading up to it and during it, for the most part. So, uh, yeah, who would have thought that you could go to a Bigfoot conference and have a Bigfoot adventure, but that's what ended up happening, and uh, the movie will be premiering at this year's Nebraska Bigfoot Conference on Saturday, 27th. I'll be the last speaker up and we'll be showing the movie in its entirety. And Blaine and myself and Christy and Rich, uh, the cast members, will be there to do Q&A afterwards after everybody gets to be barraged with way too many Bigfoot pictures all in one movie. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know the backstory on this, this was kind of a... Um, I was picking on finding Bigfoot, and so people said, hey, you know, they have a tough job. You couldn't do any better. And I went, oh, really? <laughs> well, maybe we'll just show them how it's done. Maybe I'll get oh, a team dear. of actual Bigfoot <laughs> researchers together, and we'll go to some state that we don't live in, and we'll try and find a Bigfoot and see what we can do. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Turns out, as Rich Soul once said when I asked him about finding Bigfoot, and I said, what do you think of finding Bigfoot? And Rich said, it's it's not that hard. Yeah. Not that hard. You're everywhere. That's true. Well, for some of us, it's not that hard. When you get enough of us together all in one place, it's probably, if there's any Bigfoot around, we're probably going to find them. And we did. Just, hey, come here. You want to see some Bigfoot?
That is one massive foot. So anyway, that's what we're here to talk about. And with Blaine's, uh, you know, epic trip down to the lower 48, <laughs> which is the first time coming down to a Bigfoot conference here, um, you had interesting things happening right from the get-go up there when you were trying to get on the plane. You want to tell everybody about that? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, when I was going through, uh, after I went through security, but the customs that come into the States, I was bringing down my cripple print cast and it was tucked into the big pocket on the side of a, you know, like a case that you use to bring um, a laptop. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know what to make of it. They pulled it out and they're looking at it going on like that. And finally the one guy says, what's this, a Neanderthal footprint or something like that? I said, no, <laughs> I said, no that, that's a Sasquatch print from Northern Ontario. And to be more specific, it's really rare because it's a crippled. The other, the the left foot here is crippled. You can see how it's all mangled toes and everything. And I'm showing them. And then the right foot's actually two inches longer. But anyway, it's going down to um, Bigfoot Museum in Nebraska. Here it's um, Crossroads of America, Bigfoot Museum there. And so the guy starts showing everybody. So he's showing <laughs> the other costume guy, the, the, the security guy's over. They're looking at it. And then I'm telling stories about, you know, how I got it and all this stuff. And then, you know, there's a lineup, right? But then he goes, you know, you're officially the coolest guy I've ever checked through customs. <laughs> so they give me my, yeah. So he gave me my cast back. I put it back in the, because, uh, you know, you have to take your boots and everything off to go through the scanners in the, in the little bucket and uh, the baskets. You know, the baskets go through the scanners. They yeah. check for metal objects and whatever, bombs, I don't know. But anyway, it picked up in my laptop case, it picked up the, the cast. So then they pulled it out and started asking me about it. And then, yeah, they discovered it, that it was a real Sasquatch cast from uh, their own province. And so um, <laughs> I officially became the coolest guy of customs number seven, gate seven, checked in. So, uh, yeah. You know, this is completely the opposite of the uh, reception that you get when you're at the Algonquin Park office and you start showing pe people yeah. Bigfoot pictures that you got in the park. <laughs> yeah, and videos. And, videos. and, then, and they, they don't appreciate they kind of it. Freak out. They go quit uh, scaring uh, the tourists. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they have nature sightings, you know, like a little dry erase board. The other one's putting deer, moose, black bear. So I put Sasquatch at Whiskey Creek, 1130, two days ago. <laughs> and, and, I, and then I put in brackets, filmed. <laughs> I felt that's the one who's standing in the creek right behind my kids. But for some reason, I can't pick them up with my naked eye, but the camera filmed them. And I'm filming my kids, talking to my kids about how, whatever they're doing, if they're liking the trip. And the Sasquatch is standing down there. He froze while I was looking his way. And then I panned around to show whoever would view the video. You know, oh, this is what it's like right here at this nice spot by the river. 
And then like three seconds later, I'm back and the Sasquatch already walked off, but it waited for me to look another way. And yeah. then it walked back into the woods. So that was an Algonquin and that's another one that they, they got pissed off with me about because I'm not supposed to scare all the tourists, yeah. I guess, with the Sasquatch there. But people need to know. I mean, they're they're right across the creeks and rivers, whatever. On They're watching their kids. I mean, not that there anything's going to happen, but they just they like keeping the public in total um, si um, uh, total secret about what what's actually living in a park. And then they didn't like it when I said, "Do you realize that there's been like big expeditions inside your own provincial park that you guys are not aware of?" Right? And what do you mean? I said, "Yeah, scientists from all over coming in, meeting up with researchers, like twenty of them going in and staying like a week or two at different old cottages, you know, because there's like um." People, there's some people that still have cottages before they turned it into a park right. and they got, you know, a right of lease or something to have cottages there, but, you know, grandfathered in and all that. But anyway, so they, they get re leased out or rented out and there's major expeditions going in there and the park's completely oblivious to it. Like the rangers and everybody, they don't know. They don't know about what's going on in their own park. That's but hilarious. I mean, the park's huge. The park's huge, though. I mean, it's bigger than Yellowstone. Yeah. So, or about the same size or whatever. I don't know the actual size of it, but yeah. So, um, that's all came out when I was talking to customs. Yeah, it's right here in Northern Ontario, man. And then, you know, so that's like one of 50 I got. It's just, I'm bringing this down for the museum. And then, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. And then, oh, when Harriet met me, she didn't have my name. She just put up Bigfoot on a sign. That's all she had. She didn't even have my name. She just held up a sign with Bigfoot on it. And it was kind of funny. So <laughs> Well, wow, that's pretty cool. Before we uh, get switch away from the topic, one thing that you kind of obliquely brought up was the, um, and we've mentioned this before, and I've talked with uh, several other researchers about this, including Bigfoot in Germany and others, about these weird things where you go back and you look at your video and there's a Bigfoot on it, and he's only like 20 feet away from you, and somehow, how in the hell did you not see him? But you got him on camera. Yeah. Well, uh, our... Uh, our, uh, our main guy that won the uh, Field Researcher of the Year Award this year, it's one like Bigfoot, Robert Judd, he just got a video where he walked up to this weird spot on this hill he doesn't usually go to, and he's always got those wraparound sunglasses on, and he's filming himself and talking while he's walking up there. And he's got all kinds of reflections of them in his sunglasses. He couldn't see them. And some of them are really close to him. And you can yeah. see it really clear in that sunglass reflection. As a matter of fact, he caught enough of them that he's now got a second part of this video out showing the other ones that he missed the first pass through because then he started spotting them. Oh, man, I need to go and look at this more closely. And, yeah, there were several more that he didn't notice. But, I mean, they were all around him and he couldn't see them. Yeah, it's their tricks. I've seen them do that. I've, I've encountered that. They're right beside me talking to me in either English. They're that little scratchy. Remember, I, uh, if you ever remember a video, but if we talked about it, maybe on a show that the, the Udama Res sounds or Udama Res sound, I'm not sure how to pronounce it right, but it's like scratchy ghost sounds. I've heard that yeah. right, like right beside me. And then, of course, I heard the samurai talk and all that, like within four feet of me. Four, oh, yeah, maybe four feet. Sneak up and uh, count coup on you and then run away back into the bushes again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I came right up one. Oh, I mean, if they talk about this one incident where I think it was my girlfriend, my Bigfoot girlfriend, she came up and gave me a good <laughs> sniff to see if I was wearing some Irish spring or something. And then, and then it was right when my I was turning off the volume to my phone because I got an alert for something. And so I, I was distracted right in daylight in the relatively open, like, you know, maybe where the trees cleared, like maybe the length of a living room or whatever. So I was right in the middle of a path and did broad daylight, like in 10, 30, 11 in the morning, whatever it was, came up right behind me and above me, by like two feet above me. And I heard a big intake of sniffing up over me and then thump, thump, thump through the four foot high grass and sycamores. But she still made that as she ran, like offsetting prints, running back in all in about two seconds. By the time I reacted, she was already 20, 30 feet away in cover again. But yeah, uh, <laughs> sneaking up on me, talking, uh, talking to me, right, like right close, being all cloaked or behind the veil or whatever they're doing. Um, I don't pretend to, to know each time, um, but 
they they can be really stealthy naturally, but then they got that. Yeah, sometimes don't they don't bother. You know, I do the camping thing, and when they come thump thump right up next to the tent before I even turn the friggin' yeah. light inside the tent off, or they sit there and shake the tent, or throw pebbles at it or something. It's like, well, gee, I wonder who's doing that. You know. Yeah. Have you ever had them uh, ping the tent like you know you, you can do with a finger you, like that? Yes. Have you ever had them do that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah I've had they them think that, we go to. They think we're if we're going to sleep too early, they just start throwing little pebbles at the tent to try and wake you know wake us up and get us to sit back up and tell more stories, like you know oh, the TV out, show ended them. early or something. Yeah. Well, I've had them watching me listening in. In the, uh, the office I showed you a minute ago, but it's too bright to record in. While me and you were on the air talking about Bigfoot or re- doing a recording, they'd be right outside the window enjoying our interview and everything. And <laughs> That's like Christy. She's ago. got her spying on her all the time, too. They're paying attention to everything uh, she's doing. Well, Christy spotted those huge ones in behind the 15 or uh, 17 footer at the dunes. You were mentioning there's uh, even bigger ones behind him, and he was at least 16 feet. I'm just being modest, 16 feet, but he's somewhere between 16 and 17 because there's it's only I, – I went over there and I measured the tree for some reason. It must have been uh, not right in the head to go over there, but <laughs> I went over there and I measured it because there was a V. It was one of those circumstances where you could actually get an accurate measurement where the Sasquatch was standing in the right place that you could go over and say, okay, I can find out his height because I can go measure that yeah. tree. That I can big find that band. tree. I could measure that tree. I could tell exactly how tall he was. Yeah, yeah. And it, I, it was just one of those lucky occurrences where it stepped out. Um, I was casting. And I, I maybe I was checking on my uh, cast, and it stepped out from the tree line that was giving it the natural color with this, uh, cover with this hollow hair. And it stepped out to the edge of the ridge and was right beside this tree at the 20-foot mark. There was a V. And that's what I gauged his height by. And he's only two feet or so below that that V. But then Christy, as you said, uh, sent in a picture, or she sent, there's even bigger ones behind the 17-footer. Now, that's crazy stuff. But, I mean, I, we got that picture of the Alaskan one, 20-footer. Yeah. So why not? Gigantic. I mean. Well, and then, like I pointed out, when you went back there again to do that comparison picture, you got another picture of what looked like a big one that was partially cloaked back in the tree line just off to the right of that and again he looked like yeah. he was even bigger than the one you had gotten on video yeah i mean there's a group of them there but they're all like giant size but yeah even in my follow-up i got more video of bigfoot and pictures in the follow-up to the one standing out in the open but then when i, I like i'll talk about this at the, at the conference a bit more in depth but i mean i went over there at first i thought he was a lot closer because he was so big and then I figured out, well, there's that tree there. Where's that tree? And then I'm like, oh, my God, he's on the far west side of the of the dunes. And I'm like, wow, that's yeah, a big Yeah, he was way boy. back like, on that embankment behind where they had yeah. equipment piled. Way back there. Yeah, and I'm like, wow, that guy's giant size. And he's not a like, skinny one either. He's like built Hulk. like the Hulk, but like yeah. 17 feet. So then I'm like, oh, my God, I've never had to deal with something that size. Not that it matters. A, a five-footer could carry limb from limb if it wanted to. But, I mean, I guess these guys can just, you know, one, like Tim Bits, they could eat in one bite if they wanted to. If they were in <laughs> so they anyway. Step on you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, when I was over there and I've been looking for the footage, I didn't know they could delete footage. But at the time, I just thought it was, you know, it must be somewhere on this file or it must be somewhere. But I found a 34-inch one print and that's still being a bit modest because i couldn't find the end of the big toe but i found where uh the heel strike was and then it went over uh, sorry and then it went over um a flat limestone piece that's like was level with the ground and then the toe strike where all the four toe strikes were there were 34 so then obviously the big toe is going to be bigger but since because i couldn't find the end of it which maybe I wasn't even looking far enough up. I don't know. But so I just went with 34. But I mean, oh. if you, if I ever found the big toe, it would be longer than 34. I can, so I can believe it easily for ones that are that big because, you know, this May, I found that conservative estimate 31 inch track. And we don't know exactly how long it was because it had poured rain the night before. So it washed away yeah. all the little indentations from the toes. But the main body of the track, 
that was a 140 year old gravel road bed and it crushed in like two three inches you know how much weight that would take to do that yeah so uh you yeah. know scaling that thing up you're looking at something about 16 feet tall which is about the size of the one that blaine got on that video i just i mean it's not a, 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 an exact science but if you just basically double uh, yeah like if it's a 30 inch print just half it and you're talking at least 15 feet tall right mm -hmm. around there but i mean there's some play with it. it could be 15 and a half 16 but just quick quick uh in the woods calculation that, wow there's a 17 footer or more running around here and it was so big that however the big the boulder was like an iceberg effect under the water it pushed the boulder down stepping on it an impacted boulder so maybe it doesn't usually <laughs> walk along the ridge but yeah, I mean that's how I that's how I kind of noticed it because some of the dirt was loose from that and it made made the other imprint sink in and I'm like I'm over there going oh my god there and then I'm only like six feet from the tree line right the, the oh, ridge oh, the ridge oh. goes back where the ridge goes over and there's a bit of a, a an under cove there where you know where the where the the grass and the sod go over the sand the erosion effect but it's only like six eight feet away and I'm over there with my tape measure going up uh, 20 feet <laughs> i'm looking to my right a little every now and again and what i did was i stuck my camera on a homemade monopod and i was filming the trees as some kind of security because you know they don't like being on camera so maybe they won't come towards me right while i was over there. that was that was the only security i have i don't carry <laughs> weapons so but yeah dang so there's that guy and then there's the bigger ones the, the bigger brothers and stuff in behind him which i don't want to see at all but this is only like a kilometer or a mile away from a farmhouse with kids. So that's what's that's what's in the woods behind your your farms and stuff walking by that most people are are go totally their whole lives unaware of unless they start some kind of accidental interaction happens where they see it, then the Sasquatch knows them, they've been spotted. So then that draws them in. But most people are oblivious because they don't have any interaction or encounters. And the Sasquatch just mind their own business because they think the humans are minding their own business. But they, they, I think they figure that the humans in that case don't are not aware of them. Mm -hmm. And they just keep minding their own business and stay out of uh, eyesight and contact because, you know, they don't want to be found or anything. But it's just those times where they're spotted or when they run in, run into um, the farmers or the landowners, then the Sasquatch, OK, and all the gigs up that he knows we're here. So. We have to keep an eye on him to see if our safety or our territories are threatened or whatever, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, that was uh one of the few times I ever got that was scared and being around them when I knew there was uh, the giant ones out there. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's humongo. I was for a long time hoping that they didn't get that big around here, and then I found out that no, they do. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> Some of them's carrying around those four ton trees or whatever the weight of them. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, not some of those average last four size tons we've seen them build things out of. They like they weigh three tons. What picks up something that weighs six thousand pounds and walks off with it? Yeah. No. That, um. And, uh, you know. Though they're um, and thank God they're like a peaceful species. You know, yeah. there's always the rogues and the ones that are pissed off. But I mean. Thank God, or else you know the missing cases would be a lot higher, and it wouldn't be in the middle of the woods. Yeah. They could, they could make, they could clear out a whole subdivision in one night if they wanted to. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I and I run into them in subdivisions too, like not right in the subdivision, but you mind if I check your backyard for a minute? And I go backyard and go a little bit further than how all the kids would play, and then there's a print going right there, going across parallel behind everyone's backyard, like just like 20, 30 feet past the tree line, in, inside the tree line. And they don't know about it. They're completely oblivious, right? But, and, and yeah, uh, <laughs> ignorance is bliss sometimes. So anyway, getting oh, yeah. back to the epic trip. So you finally uh, got got down there. You had the Harriet holding up the Bigfoot sign. So to the, with her holding that up above her head, the top of the sign was at what, about four feet? Yeah, uh, four and four, 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 two, or <laughs> So yeah, she's, well, Harriet, she's that's a little it, lazy. This is the inside joke. Harriet's very, very short. Yeah, she sees eye to eye yeah, with she Hobbit. Makes Christy looked tall. Yeah, Christy's like a stilt compared to her. Christy's a women's basketball player around her. 
So, so yeah, when you, so that. when you finally got down there, you you actually spent a couple of days around there helping uh, Harriet with some other stuff, and then we finally showed up, and the uh, Wild Man bunch was all there, ready to go. The only person we didn't have with the team, of course, was Rich Soul, who was uh, further away. And uh, we had gotten a hold of him. Actually, I did. I went, we're not going to do the town hall meeting. Instead, I'm just going to call the best Bigfoot researcher in the state and ask him where the Bigfoot are. So that's what I did. And then Rich said, well, I got a few hours. You guys can meet me over here and we'll go look around in some of the a couple of hot spots and see if we can find anything. So we all piled into the vehicles and everybody was totally beat up from either flying or driving there and did not want to get up and go anywhere. And that <laughs> especially included me. And I had to be the one that was trying to rabble rouse everyone going, come on, this is the only chance we're going to get. We got to get out there and find Bigfoot in the basket. Everybody's like, eh. <laughs> shambling into the vehicles, half asleep, yeah. not happy about it. Well, then two <laughs> hour drive later, we finally got to the, Bigfoot hotspot in Nebraska, which, as it turned out, was this their capital city of Lincoln. <laughs> we went to the yeah. suburbs of Lincoln because <laughs> yeah. there's a couple little wetlands there where there's uh, some uh, areas that you can't build on because, you know, like floodplains and little uh, rivers and stuff going through there, Salt Creek. And so that's what we did. We went to two different spots on Salt Creek, and we went to a little interpretive center with some bison before we went there. And so for our three hours, we had about an hour in each place and then some driving time in between, and then we came back again. And boy, oh, boy, did we find all kinds of Bigfoot evidence. That was yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. Didn't take us long either. No. It was actually, it was funny because at the – at the first place, we were like, we found all the evidence nearby within about 15 minutes, and then everybody was busy wandering around, hobnobbing and photobombing each other. And then the yeah. <laughs> second place we got to, there was a, it was you know more active there. That was more, uh, more interesting stuff there as far as like structures and everything. But both of them were really cool. I mean, there was stuff, you know, there was definitely activity at both of them. Northwest part of the loop of the uh, creaky thing here. Um, there's a track over there coming up the mount up the hill. And I'm gonna mark this for Richard or Scott. Now I'm not sure, but there's no hair in it for a coyote. And bear scouts usually like in a pile. Those are tube shaped. And black could uh, indicate meat diet. And we found uh, over that way, we found a uh, deer kill. Well, yeah, um, that's where I veered off and I. Uh, Found the tree bent over, broken over uh, the trail, and then I'm I'm at the end of uh, the trail where I guess maybe it loops around or just maybe just stopped at the deep creek there, um the 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 side walls of the creek um, but there's a tracks there and then so I'm looking around and then I got like a wood knock, and because you guys were goofing on me at the other site, 
I thought it was you guys. So I yelled back to the actual Sasquatch or Bigfoot in the trees right across from this deep, this creek. Yeah, I'm not falling for that. And I yelled at them and then I was just hung around a little bit. And I think they were puzzled by that. They're like, what? what? <laughs> but then, and then when I, I met up with you guys again, I like, yeah, nice try, guys. Trying to trick me with more wood knocking and calls and stuff because you guys tried that at the other location, right? And then they said, no, we were way over there. Uh, then, oh my god, that's what that was real Sasquatch then. All right, so then I pointed out where they were to Richard, and we went over there and stuff. But that's pretty funny stuff. Telling the Sasquatch I wasn't going to fall for that. Yeah, so. let's uh, actually let's show everybody the video of that right now. All right, so just a quick, um, quick video uh, back from Nebraska, obviously, out at one of my old spots. Uh, I want to talk about um, <clears throat> while I was uh, out footing with the with the Duke, Christy, Richard, uh, Ash, um, and uh, there's another lady there. Um, I was in the woods and uh, I found some prints, Scott, I uh, got a little video of one trying to hug a branch to hide, but while I was there, the guy started pranking me doing calls. So I knew it was them, but they were out the parking lot wanting to go to another spot. But anyway, so I just ignored it, made my way back. After uh, I think I found the scat and like a little makeshift shelter and then we went to another location I veered off again on my own. I found a arch over a trail that was bent purposely to keep people off the trails and Then actually I fell after that I slipped on some mud. So I'm glad no one's seen that <laughs> but Not long after that. I just came to the edge of the uh, creek and there's a grove of trees on that side It's kind of sparse, but there's this particular grove of trees and uh, I got wood knocked, tree knocked. Except I thought it was those uh, jokers clowning around with me. So I shouted back at the real Sasquatch. I'm not falling for that. <laughs> it was actually real Sasquatch. So, And then uh, when I made my way back to the trail, past the arch over the trail, and then I caught up to the guys coming back. I said, was that you guys clowning with me, trying to uh, um, prank me? And they said, no, we were way over there. I said, oh, well, you know what? That did sound like a real tree knock because it was really deep and heavy. Like, you know, someone's picking up like a tree trunk almost. But anyway, so then I led the uh, guys back to the, round the arch. And then I pointed out across the creek. I didn't film it because I thought I was being pranked. And I pointed across the creek where, uh, to Richard, his area. I said, that's where the wood knock came from. So true story, Nebraska, the 2023 NBC conference there and uh, we all went out footing so that's that story that was never recorded all right I'm gonna head my way up okay so uh yeah that was pretty hilarious and uh no it wasn't any of us because you know that was on the other side of the creek and there was a train yeah. going by, which is when you snuck up on the embankment, that train going by was covering all your sounds. And then as soon as the train went by, they spotted you and went, pop, would knock. And you thought it was one yeah. else. We were way the hell behind you. I don't even know how to get across that river over to the other side where it was. <laughs> yeah, I went in an area where uh, don't enter at your own risk, there was a sign or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to scare people away. I just went, whatever, and then. Yeah, I went in there, and I don't know if that was so much for me. I, mean, I think it might have been trying to alert other Sasquatch. It might have been even on my side behind me. Yeah. That there's, there's a human right in with you guys Yeah, if you didn't hear him. Well, he could have been sitting yeah. back behind where the train was going past, and as soon as the train went past, you're on the other side of the creek, and he could see you standing right there. He's like, oh, shit, human pop. Yeah, I think it was more of an alert for the other ones, because yep. usually when I my experience is you, you don't just get one. Yeah, they'll try to like knock, knock, knock. Don't worry, go and we want to, we want to be entertained longer, or you don't have to, whatever. But usually, when it's one good one, 
it's like an alert call to the other ones that got their guard down that, hey, man, a human found his way in here. You know, watch out or beware or whatever they do. Yeah. Whatever it's supposed to mean to them. But, yeah, the one good one, and then that was it. So that that <laughs> I thought it was you guys joking on me, and then uh, it was actually real Sasquatch sending out the alarm that there was a human right in the middle of them all, and, and somehow I snuck up on them because the train was uh, covering my sound and stuff. So that was pretty funny stuff. <laughs> I thought, was, I thought okay. you guys were tricking me. <laughs> well, Blaine was kicking was butt, stuff. as you guys will see in the movie. He found lots of tracks and a bunch of other stuff while we were there, and unfortunately he wasn't with us when we found the deer carcass and then walked down that to where the teepee structure was we were on a little promontory with the creek on one side of us and right then christy goes there's one right over there and she pulls out her cell phone tries to zoom in get picture of it and i'm looking it's like way the hell over there i can't even see what she's looking at and i'm going where and she goes right there okay so I got my camera and I'm trying to zoom in. I'm wiggling too much. I can't see it. I go running over to this tree and I just like slam my hand against the tree, use the tree to stabilize me. So now it's stabilized and my flip out screen has glare from the sun behind me on it. So I still can't see what the hell I'm looking at. So I aim the camera. Okay, it looks like that's the spot over there. Zoom in. Hopefully I got it. There's a few seconds. Okay, and I'll move it around a little bit. Hopefully, I, well, I just lucked out and happened to get the right spot. And yeah, there was uh, definitely two of them over there. One of them was kind of behind this little pile of brush, and you could see top of his cone head sticking up. The other one is over to his right, and there's a tree there, and there's this really black spot right there. Well, this is early spring. There's no leaves or anything. There's nothing to make this black spot right there. See the dead tree to the side of it there? It didn't snap off that one. See the one right there? It didn't snap off that one. Where did that come from? looked to me like when I panned a little bit to the right there was a third grayish one that was just stationary because you could see an object that looks exactly like a Bigfoot's head and face over there yeah Jesus would be the main one's left so uh, of course they're staying on the other side of the creek from us they're trying to maintain their hiddenness as much as they could get away with but Christy's got like friggin x-ray vision she spotted them anyway and then I was lucky enough to get a few seconds to you know stabilize zoomed in so you could actually see what the hell we were looking at but that was pretty cool and then some of the other stuff that i like the one the thing that you found where they had actually pulled a branch down right across the trail like it's really obvious there's this well-beaten trail there and they're like how the hell is this branch pulled down on this thing? you know well it's kind of like more like a tree like how you know how a tree split yeah yeah, yeah, it's more like a more like part of a tree, not a branch, but I mean, I guess a tree that branches off. I guess sort of best way to describe it. But you you couldn't bend that. A human couldn't break that no, down. It was like do it. No. Eight, eight, it was like ten inches thick, and it bent it over a tree like a piece of licorice. Well, the one it bent it over the trail like a piece of licorice. Exactly. That's so, what it looked um, like. It looked like it, you know, just bent it without breaking it to yeah. somehow. Like how the hell? Yeah, I mean. 
Oh, they and do you that. know it wasn't oh, always like that because the this is well beaten really worn trail that goes right underneath it. You know, it's like yeah. how did this trail get beaten down if that thing was there forever? Obviously it wasn't. The other weird thing that I found that one uh, basically a whole tree that was hanging from another tree upside down. And, you know, as Rich pointed out, it never floods down there that much. That can't be water that did that. That's down in the yeah. valley. There isn't any tornadoes down there ripping out trees that have a two-foot thick trunk and cramming them in another tree upside down, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's not weather-related or whatever. No. You know, and that's, again, you know, some of this stuff, and you find it, and you go, okay, is it water? No, it can't be water. Is it wind? No, it can't be wind. Where the hell even is the stump for this thing? We couldn't even find that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it isn't like this is a really thick area. It's fairly wide open, and you're like, well, how in the bleep does that happen? You know, <laughs> so you have to right, still, you whittle right. down all the possibilities, and then you get to something literally moved this damn thing and put it there. And what could do that? So apparently yeah. they got some big biggies there too. Yeah, and the small little uh, park. I mean. I got more woods behind my backyard than some of the areas there. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I mean, they can go wherever they want. It's pretty obvious. I don't know. If, I mean, people are just kind of catching up to that now. But if you're doing this as long as me and you, you know that they can go wherever they want. Yeah. Right? And they like waterways, too. Any place where there's little rivers or creeks or ponds or anything like that, you're more liable to find them there. And this, of course, it isn't right in the middle of town, in the suburbs, all on the edge of town, but, you know, miles of oh, suburbs where the in every direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were almost oh, out where, where the buffalo, the buffalo used to roam. Yeah. <laughs> the buffalo used yeah. to roam. That's and then, right. Uh, so, yeah, we had a, anything else you wanted to talk about on when we were out there? I mean, it sounded like when we were getting ready to leave, because Rich had to leave and my ankle was given out, there was some that were just way down the pathways in that one direction that you had like pretty much scoped out. Yeah. You sure you guys want to leave right now? There's some over here. I want to go check these guys out. And yeah. I, I, I tracked them right down to like, I found initial prints there and a rudimentary shelter. And then I, I followed the, the signs and uh, to uh, a fresh, relatively fresh scat day, less than a day old tracks going down the embankment of that Creek, same, creek but like a different uh part of it um another rudimentary shelter this one was smaller but it had more cover and then they're on i mean I, they probably were in in the same kind of island area where i was but they were definitely on the other side of that creek and you could you could feel them their eyes on you watching everything you do you know when you got that okay yes. they're on me here yes they're, they got me marked here and uh so i was right there going you know i'm in the middle of like yeah, I'm just waiting for them to do something to confirm that we're in the middle of a, a, having an encounter. And then um, I start hearing you guys calling me and stuff. And I'm like, geez, I'm right here beside Fresh Scott, a, a, a shelter. And they're probably on my left, but they're definitely on my right across this little um, creek ravine area and in the tree line watching to see how maybe how Snoopy I was going to be around the shelter, which I didn't get Snoopy because I learned that you, you just – if there could be little ones in there, and you don't want to get a rock in the head. No. Right? So you found it. Great. But leave it alone because it's an active shelter. And, um, yeah, and then I started thinking, you know what? This could go bad. And then I started working my way back, and then I ended up working my way to the parking lot where you guys were all calling my name and doing calls and stuff. But, yeah, I mean, that, that, could, have went, that could have went bad, too, because when I tracked them down, it was way too close to the shelter where little infants would be and stuff. And then the scat was, it wasn't a really big pile of scat, but it was definitely human shaped. So definitely a small, um, small one, my size or smaller in the immediate vicinity. And then, yeah, you're like, where are the big ones? <laughs> right? Yeah, where, exactly. are the, where are the so, the big ones are around. And that, that was the yeah. other thing. The second location we were at, I mean, the first one, we found lots of, general signs of you know average sasquatch the second place we were at man we were finding tons of signs of the kids all kinds of structures they had made for them to play in their tracks all over the damn place and that must be some place the adults like to leave the kids at night 
when they go throttle a deer or whatever it is they're doing for a couple hours, you know. Yeah. And actually, I'm kind of surprised that, I mean, there weren't, I mean, because we're experienced, I guess, not that hard to find, but there's a public trail not too far away. Right? Yeah, I know. I'm like, okay, there's a, there's a well-used public trail here. There's a big stick structure there. There's this, and then the people are, I guess, if, they're, if they don't know anything about their behavior or what they do, they just, oh, yeah, some homeless guy built that 30-foot structure. <laughs> or some little, you know what I mean? They don't, it's not in, on their radar to clue in what they're actually walking past, yeah. right? And then, so the one, the the people that are, and you know, um, not aware that they're in the middle of a Sasquatch habitat, they're actually the entertainment for the Sasquatch because they like watching and then they, they're they watching to see if the people notice their obvious signs, you know, structures and and arches and all that stuff and it's their entertainment that's why it was so close to the trail then it was so easy for our group to pick up on it because you could just we were just walking the public trail initially and go oh there's stuff right there there's stuff over there you know there's a print there right and they were like wow so this is this is pretty hot place there richard and i mean it took us five minutes to find all this evidence and then we started we all divided up This is really awesome. That is so freaking cool. You can actually go into it. Yeah, it's boundary markers. That means boundaries. Look, they got they got one over here behind it. This must be a playground for the kids. Actually, one of my favorite uh, things that happened while I was there went over to that big cluster of big structures that they had, and then going off. I think it was to the north of it, and to the east, there's this game trail. And I'm like, ooh, here's their in, you know, access point right here. Here's a game trail. So I go walking down the game trail and I stop because there's a game cam on the tree facing away from where all the structures are to, you know, oh, yeah. whoever's coming out of the woods toward the structures, they think they're uh -huh. gonna catch they're gonna catch it, it on the game cam, right? And see who's walking right. through there. So I haven't walked in front of the game cam yet. So I pull out my camcorder. And I take my camcorder and I stick it around the tree and film the game cam. And then I bring it back again. <laughs> well, I do a little public service announcement about how incredibly easy it is for Bigfoot to spot these things. Because I'm not looking for a game cam. It's on the opposite side of the tree. And it was like obvious as hell to me. Imagine how obvious it is to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like putting one up in someone's living room. It's like, Are you kidding yeah. me? Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, well, you never get anything oh. on game cams. Well, the only person I know that gets anything on game cams is uh, William Lunsford and his team down there. And that's because they hide them. They put them in brush piles and stuff. They don't tie them to a tree trunk where they're obvious. Yeah, they put them in hollow logs and that. that's really, yeah. that's really smart. Yeah, and that that's yeah. the only reason they're getting anything. Because <laughs> you know, they just yeah, but don't, and then the Yeah, but do the Sasquatch know they're actually still there because they're getting like the little ones investigating the camera inside the hollow <laughs> log. So you can't even trick them when you're putting them in logs. They know. Yeah. So I don't well, use them a lot. Black, but... They had that one in a brush pile too, and he was looking at like, is there a camera over there? Oh shit, there is. <laughs> he's like, are you guys kidding me? <laughs> yeah. And usually, then they get mad. And they throw the camera like fifty yards or so bigger, trying to eat it. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, yeah, we had our little three-hour tour. A three-hour tour. <laughs> we got lost. We got lost. lost. Oh, <laughs> Creek. Yeah. And we put up uh, uh, noon in our drone and flew him around in both locations so you could see some aerial view. And you can see just how wide open it is. 
No leaves on the trees. No leaves on any of the bushes. And yet they could still sneak around and hide on you in there. They're just, you're, they're amazing. Uh, that's, they're not only their natural abilities, but they're, I guess, paranormal abilities. I mean, if you're not aware of it and you're not in tune with it, and then if they haven't marked you or whatever, then, you know, then you're going to walk right by it and then you wouldn't even know it. Right. But I yeah. mean, like a, a lot of us here, you, me, Christy, Robin, we've all been marked. So, I mean, I've had them show up at my campsite within before you've got the tent up and you smell them like <laughs> six feet away from you while you're putting in the tent pegs. I'm like, really? Give me a chance to set up. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I, just had, um, I just said that last year and I crawled, crawled into my tent. I haven't even got the lamp in the tent off. I'm getting ready to go to sleep and I hear thump, thump right next to the tent. <laughs> like, can't even wait until I'm like maybe supposedly asleep. You got to walk right yeah. up. I'm still awake, obviously. I'm still yeah. wrestling around with my blankets trying to get them all situated before I even turn the lamp off. Thump, thump right next to the tent. Okay. <laughs> Mr. <Yeah>. Impatient. <laughs> yeah. I mean, once they're dialed in on you, if they're curious, I've had to happen several times. I lost count. You know, even when I'm not out footing, they uh, show up and, you know, I hear them, smell them, see them. Um, if I'm sh with my family, they would knock like crazy all around us because, you know, there's kids. Yeah. I got kids and they got kids. All right, there's females, whatever. They react to it. I'll get a courtesy few couple knocks, but if I show up with my wife or my kids, they're knocking for two hours. I'm like, come on. <laughs> I sit out in the cold for three hours recording and wood knock, a little whoop here and there, a little bit of dial. And then I bring out the, the ladies or the kids, and you guys are like, you go bonker, bonkers like on a game show or something, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and it, it was so, not aggressive, but it was so consistent that it kind of creeped out my family. And so they, we said, we we like to go, right? Because, you know, they don't mind a couple polite ones and all that, but right from the time you take 10 feet, inside the tree line right from the time you're almost at the car they were wood knocking because i had my kids and my wife with me and i'm like come on i mean it was great because i guess it confirmed to them okay dad's not making all this stuff up <laughs> <laughs> well it had that one positive side effect you know and i've yeah, seen that yeah. in my videos too i guess they're just kind of bored with me at this point but i'll bring somebody new up there that they like and oh my god at keith crabtree up there and the first morning he was up there he comes crawling out <laughs> his camper and i'm like oh I'm surprised you're up so early and he's like couldn't sleep anymore all these wood knocks kept waking me up <laughs> yeah and then they tickle his feet and they tickle that like, was the next they, night they tickled yeah. his feet. but same thing when i had william lunsford up here oh my god they must really like him because man were they putting on the display they're making all kinds of weird noises they pushed over two trees they're whistling at us all the time trying to get us to come back out in the woods and oh my god yeah, yeah, yeah. The show was over. You had to go back to the campsite. So I'm like, oh, they wanted an encore. Yeah, right? I'm just, I'm boring. They don't even care about me. And I got my uh, uh, pure-blooded Indian roommate. Uh, he's part Sioux and part Salish. And he was camping up in the same spot with me this uh, last fall. And it's the first time he's been camping up there. And he didn't even have a tent. He'd just sleep in his car. So I go walk down to the campsite down by the river and set up my tent. He's on the road in his car i'm down there by myself and i go yeah. you know what's gonna happen he goes what and i said they're gonna ignore me and they're gonna screw around with you all night because you're up here by yourself in the car <laughs> and he goes oh yeah, yeah. i went yeah well guess what happened exactly what i said yeah he couldn't sleep for like three hours you could hear him walking around the car he could feel the car shake some of them were so heavy when they walked past it the car would shake and he could hear him going oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well i've had that actually um that I don't, i'm not usually in my car when i see them uh, there was a time when i was laid up a little bit but um i've been going out i go out more at night out more at night i mean i go out during the day to film and to do some videos but i go out at night and i just go to a swampy area and i don't i don't use use a flash i have a flashlight with me but since i'm on the road i don't even use one right because it kind of 
limits it, the light actually blinds you after a while where you can only see where the flashlight is yeah. right so but anyway i was out walking around and actually my wife was with me with them and this time and they came right up to the car and we're, you know I, I don't know how to describe this you know that snorting sound like the horses will make you know like you yeah. know or whatever there's some kind of but they were snorting sniffing or huffing at us from within the range of a uh, of a dirt road like the width of it right yeah. they were just on the inside of the dirt road wherever and they they got that close to us and we were just sitting on the hood of the car no lights or anything after we did a little bit of strolling around and they come right up to us and my wife seen eye shine oh. um yeah it was juvie though eye shine it wasn't one of the big ones it was you know i mean good good for her so she didn't get too scared because it's just a one our size right ducking yeah. down and trying to keep away when we were leaving the you know i turned off all the lights but there's still the nighttime driving lights that the, the uh, eye shine got caught up in the reflection so um yeah i mean i've been doing more of that and i've heard them calling in the middle of the night when i, I heard some really good calls but it was raining so i couldn't leave my mic out oh. but i was there still like at 11 o'clock at night and i heard them make some beautiful long calls two or three calls but I couldn't leave my mic running because of the weather. It would have destroyed my microphone. But um, yeah, I've had some other eye shine, uh, eye glow incidents at the museum there. <laughs> yeah, we should probably talk about that next because after we went down to Salt Creek and caught them down there and filmed all kinds of other evidence, and we came back and me and Blaine and Christy were all staying at the museum. And me and Blaine were sleeping in the downstairs of the museum. And apparently in the middle of the night, one of them came to show Blaine that, yes, there is such a thing as eye glow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, first he had to wake me up. <laughs> he had to wake me up with constant, like, um, or a small one was, but tapping, tap, 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 right? And I'm like, oh, all right, well, I guess I'll just get up and go to the washroom, wake Duke up going by, and Duke will give me hell. But anyway, so I came back, and I seen these um, red eye reflector things looking at me. So I'm like, What's that? You know, is that like so? What I immediately went to, oh, that's got to be one of Harriet's big cutouts that she used, like bike reflectors, like round reflectors for eyes. Yeah. And it's picking up light somewhere. And so I'm looking at it, looking at it, I'm like, what? The only oh, problem with that look, theory is that she doesn't have any cutouts with bike reflectors for eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I asked her the next day about that. And she goes, no, I don't. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, Okay, is this what I'm seeing, or is it, yeah, it's got to be one of her cutouts? <laughs> so then I crawled back in the sleeping bag and on the air matches and more taps on the window, right? So eventually uh, I had to use the washroom again because you know, I'm drinking too much water there or whatever. And um, and then came back and then the eyes were there again. So we're just, I'm just looking at them, going, "What is this? What I'm seeing?" Or I'm looking around the room, going, "There's like some kind of reflection of." lights you know i know there's a exit sign in the inside the the room but it wouldn't do two separate eyeball lights you know it'd be like like a, a one like pattern glare right and yeah and then the blinds are all down except for that the area and i'm seeing the eyes looking at me and i'm like what so we had a bit of a staring contest it didn't move it looked like it was back back the size of it it was either really close which it probably wasn't i was thinking more it was back by the some outside uh, investigation. Um, last night, red glowing eyes looking at me in through here. My air mattress is in there. Uh, started around 2 a.m. I mean, it could have been sooner, but that's the first time I went for a washroom break. Uh, went for another washroom break around 3. But it all started with uh, something uh, slapping the house like that. And then, all right, yeah, I got it. You guys are here all these Bigfoot magnets right don't even and then if we just come over here well, I, I'm just trying to guess just trying to guess where the eyes were but I know the height I mean I could have been here or it could have been a bigger one back there by Bob Gimlin but definitely this is the angle so it either was here or was standing between the Bob Gimlin cutout and the little billboard but the eyes were way up here because if they were lower there's no angle for me to notice them so I'm I'm in there looking out and it's looking back at me and uh, I'm just gonna show you <clears throat> I'm just gonna show you how high the eyes were because I'm gonna have to stand on that to show you. Maybe like this. Maybe like this. 
like that. And again, because I only took a quick tour back here, I thought maybe it was one of Harriet's uh, Bigfoot cutouts, but there isn't any. There might be one over there, like tree peeking, but you know, they only got like little painted. There's nothing, nothing uh, to um, indicate why the glowing red eyes, like it's almost like they had a flashlight behind them or something. So uh, pretty awesome. I've always wanted to see that. I've only seen eye shine in that. But uh, I think it's one of the girls' jealous Bigfoot coming around because we've all been having lots of fun and stuff like that, joking around and trolling each other and stuff. But yeah, if it comes back tonight, I'm going to come out and film the son of a gun. But anyway, pretty cool stuff here at the Harriet's Bigfoot, Crossroads of America Harriet's Bigfoot Museum. And the NBC 2023? Yeah, right. All right. Where the trail curves and there's some buildings there, little structures, and there's a, a tree or two. I think it was back there, so it was it was at least ten feet tall, but I think I was too aggressive with tracking them down, and like getting too close to that shelter. Remember I was saying where are the adults, yeah. and so that that created a follow up visit with with dad or whoever it was, um, giving, me, <laughs> giving me the red eye treatment, right? <laughs> so I, I was thinking I was too aggressive hunting them down, and then like I said, I backed away and I left, and then but sure enough, they showed up at the museum. And Christy got a good picture of one, like at night. Remember, she was taking pictures, yep. and there was one yep. that looked You'll, like you guys will like see that in the movie too. That has been like strictly not dude. strictly not yeah, been yeah, released yeah. anywhere. Me and Christy were out uh, around the side of the museum having a cigarette about one o'clock in the morning, and she goes, "Oh my God, there's one standing right there!" And pulls her phone up, and takes a picture, and I'm like, "Oh my God!" So then, yeah, that you'll see that too. The next day, we were out there and we found a couple of vague tracks. Again, it's you know gravel, gravel uh, road bed, and it wasn't a particularly big one. What were the tracks like? 15, 16 inches, or something like that. I think yeah, 15. yeah. That, I mean, average, average yeah. size that most people find, but, but uh, cool but picture. Out because, of business. Yeah, there's like this little. Uh, wood line right off the edge of the driveway that's yeah, like three trees deep maybe if that and right behind that giant cornfield so all completely yeah. open and there's one of them standing right in between these trees looking at her and when you look at the picture you can see there's a second one behind him and there absolutely are no trees or bushes or anything there that, yeah, you know, that we could have been thinking was a bigfoot that would have been way more surprising to me if it had been for the previous year when I was there. I went outside, uh, and we had a horrible windstorm the previous year. It was like 50-mile-an-hour winds the whole damn time we were there. Wow. And, uh, so you couldn't even light your cigarette. You had to light it before you walked out the door. You couldn't get it lit. So we were out there, and the wind's blowing, and Christy sees one of them in the backyard, and she's talking to him and stuff. And Again, I got my back to him, and I'm not going to bother to turn around. I can't see anything anyway. So I just finished my sig. We go inside. Well, then about in, you know two hours later, I was just about getting ready to go to sleep and wanted to have one more sig before I went to bed. So I came out on the back porch there, and I'm standing there, and I'm looking out into the backyard, and I'm doing the same thing as Blaine. I'm going, what? There isn't a Bigfoot cutout right there, is there? Yeah. I remember seeing one there, and I start looking at it, and I'm like, that's not a cutout. That's an actual Bigfoot. I can see his eyes blink. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. I said, uh, I'll say, oh, uh, I'm just going to finish my SIG. I'm going back indoors again. You have a good night. <laughs> have a good night. Yeah, but just, just bizarre, you know, that she's got him lurking around there. And, you know, this is Nebraska. It's her whole area is mostly surrounded by cornfields. There's a few stands of pine trees and stuff. But it's not like you would ever think that you would see a Bigfoot in any of these kind of places. They can just go anywhere. Right. And didn't... um. She got a handprint on her car two years in a row. Or did was it and then well, did Keith Christy got, Keith Christy's got rental well. car the year before she had gotten handprints all over it. And we didn't find them until like right before we had to bring the car back. So we quickly ran and grabbed tape and pulled off all the fingerprints off all the the uh because it was on more than one window. And we've got yeah. those on a pane of glass. It's actually in the museum. So if you guys go to the museum you can see the fingerprints we lifted off christy's car when she was there the year before and the cripple print yeah and the, the cripple print, print. And, and you can see my uh uh picture of the largest x structure ever documented <laughs> yeah that's a it's that's a good it's a good uh 
I was actually one of the better museums I've ever been in. Yeah, just she, just, so she keeps upgrading it all the time. It's getting better and better and better and better. And now she's got a whole additional building that she's got all set up. And she's making yep. uh, a new display on the genealogy of the giants, which I don't know of any museums that have anything like that in there. I'm helping her put that together, which is one of the right. reasons I'm showing up a little early to help her with that for the conference. Right. But yeah, it so, sounds like we might be able to sneak out and go try and do some uh, some big footing there in Nebraska again yeah. this year because you're going to be there a little bit early. I'm going to be there early. We'll see if we got yeah. some other uh, people around that want to go out with us. Sure. Here I'll go. Or just go hang out in the museum and let them come to us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Actually, I'd like but to go I think down that's to... always triggered by footing and then they come back. Uh, go footing, yeah. Yeah, the the second location we were at, I'd like to go back down there again because if you recall, the road adjacent to it, you got guardrails on that one side, and then the other side there's a big open field that we pulled into that's got all the yeah. hiking trail stuff. Well, as that's we right. were going out, I was looking at that other side of the creek on the other side of the guardrail where there aren't any hiking trails, but there are really huge tree structures. I want to go yeah. check that place out. Yeah, pretty obvious. I mean, you look around, you look around, and there's, <laughs> it doesn't get any more obvious than this. And, you know, so, uh, yeah, I also heard that Richard, uh, he did some camping in fields near uh, cave openings and pretty, <laughs> yeah. pretty interesting stuff there to come listen to Richard at this year's conference about them uh, shaking his tent and or looking inside. You know how the tent's got the venting? Uh, yeah. webbing and they've seen the heads press right against the top of the tent looking in to see if he's sleeping or not so make sure you come and listen to uh, Richard too whatever day he's speaking on nope. um, he's, he's not it's speaking be... this year but he is going to be there with us after the movie presentation so you can get a chance to ask him any questions or anything you want then in the meantime right. go study his channel Knox Gigas project <laughs> You can see all of his old videos and stuff. Now, he's done a lot of work with uh, Barry Webster and the Red Squatching guys, uh, which is north of uh, where he's at on the Omaha Reservation. And, of course, you know, big reservation land, you've always got Bigfoot hanging around there. So yeah. those guys have kind of, again, got a really good spot where they can go kind of do as much research as they want. Because apparently the the Sitangas that they've got there are uh, kind of lackadaisical about whether humans see them or not. <laughs> so it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, that's always good. Mine are always being careful up here. Mine are always like, you know, until they until they get used to you a little bit, then they'll give you a bit more and a bit more. And that that's how it works, right? When they got, like, um, they don't have to be territorial because they got so much land. They have so much resources. There's a lake, river, every mile. <laughs> right so they don't they're not they're not um cornered in any little pockets because they can just basically walk for an hour and be in a, another remote area with more with fresh water and more game or yeah. whatever right? they, don't, they, they don't have to be territorial and unless it's one of the ones with the snouts then those guys are just a-holes yeah, anyway yeah they got good yeah. assholes well you know yeah. i think it's kind of the similar thing here in montana because you don't have very many people but you have gigantic mountain. We have 52 mountain ranges and 24 million acres of forest. Yeah. And less yeah, than a million no, people. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love that state. The people only live down in the valleys, all the mountains and stuff. That's yeah, those, that's like state land and federal land and parks. And people yep. generally just don't even live there. So guess where the Bigfoot are? Well, the 52 yeah. mountain ranges that they got all of themselves pretty much. That's where they're living. Well, it's like a highway for them. They can follow the Rockies and all that, all the offshoots of the Rockies right up in the Canada and in, in Alberta and BC and stuff like that. You know? Oh, I've, I've said this before too, where we're at right here. I'm a three and a half hour drive from the Canadian border. But if you wanted to walk it, you could go from here to the Canadian border and only have to cross two roads right right yeah yeah i mean it's almost that remote here um we are like like northeastern ontario but if you go an hour or two north and just like what the last big uh, highway after that other than maybe one really northern highway that goes across all canada you got free roam right up to the arctic circle 
Yeah. So I mean, then you know, I showed you, I showed you, I sent you the picture of the, the one uh, up in Alaska, the twenty footer. Oh God. Yeah. You know, from the mining. The, the, uh, the unfortunate group. copter pilot got the video. <laughs> This way to safety and no ridicule. This way to admitting you just saw a 20 foot Sasquatch. Yeah, I think I added that into the picture. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, and when again, it's it tall, above the tallest that. tree, you got to admit it that you see what you're seeing is what you're <laughs> yeah, seeing. It's taller than the trees around it. I know that was the best part. Yeah, dude, it's kind of hard to hide the trees when you're taller than the trees are. Yeah, I don't but think again, when, you know, when you're that big, to, you don't care. <laughs> getting back to the Lord of the Sass Dunes and his apparent buddies that he had there with him. Uh, oh, right. I mean, it's just mind-boggling how big they are. But again, when you take into account what Blaine was just saying, they've got this massive amount of land. There's no people up there to bother them. They've got all the resources for water and food that they could possibly need. What's the limit on how big are they going to get? Right. And you, plus right. you've got, what is it, Hansen's law that says the further north you go, the larger animals tend to be anyway because of conservation of body heat. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they go further north and then until you get to the, like the, the ice pack or the tundra or whatever, they got unlimited land, they got moose, deer, caribou, maybe some elk. They got unlimited, they got fish, there's Musk salmon in the, in the river. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> musk ox, but I mean... Why not? I mean, um, you just, when you first get into it, you you know, everyone's thinking the stereotypical eight footer, right? Or patty size. And, you know, they're thinking, you know, all the, all the Sasquatch that they run into is going to act like Patty, the female. And that's where, that's where the perception goes astray because females act totally different than the males and you usually run into males because they're bolder, they don't care what are you going to do against them, right? And the females you catch by accident, but the males will come towards you. The females will flee to the closest tree line. I said this to MK Davis, and like with the regarding the Patterson Gimlet footage, the females usually ninety nine percent of the time will flee towards the closest tree line. If they, the first they'll try to outweigh you, and then wait for you to look away, and then they'll, they're gone, right? But the males, especially if there's a fear, they'll come towards you. They're not like the what people's perception of how Sasquatch will behave, like from the Patterson footage or Freeman. The males will come right at you and maybe stop at the last tree to try to give them some semblance of cover or not. Yeah. Right. But um that's what you learn. Like, oh my God, like, you know, when you first start doing this, I mean it maybe it's different now for the new crop of researchers, but you know, you grow up on Patterson and Freeman, you're thinking that these Sasquatch are gonna be timid. That's just the females. The males will come right at you, and you're you're like, you might, is my life in danger here? What's going on? This isn't how all the Patterson film worked out, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, so you're thinking, I'd like to see one, but from a football field away or something, right? But that's not the case. If you spot them, they have to make sure you're not a threat, and they'll and the males will come right at you and stop, like right outside your car. If there's a tree line four feet away, they'll be right at that four foot line hovering over you looking into your car making sure you have no other arterial plans to do with uh, spotting them right so so there's trust built up but the first couple run-ins it's usually there's a lot of um there's a lot of judgment going on if you're going to be a threat or not right but i mean um yeah that's what you learn when you get into it that um they're not going to behave like patty you're not going to run into females you run into females maybe not even maybe 10 percent of the time it's all young males and maybe some bitter older males and some older females that are, they've learned enough to maybe just sit and watch and wait till you lose interest. But 90, maybe 75% of the time, it's always younger males, eight feet or, or smaller, 15 years old or smaller coming at you because they're bold, they're aggressive, they've got full of testosterone from their, their age group. And so, yeah, I mean, um, you learn that. But you don't expect to see twenty footers running around in your one of your research areas. God no. Uh, you know this reminds me of something that there was a Bigfoot researcher who was at a native gathering. There was they were having some kind of a powwow or potlatch or something, and he was walking around and he was doing his best to ask the natives if they had any Bigfoot stories or they talked to him about it. And they're all kind of like 
what do you care? You're white man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. go away. No, we don't know anything about Bigfoot. Even if we did, we wouldn't tell you. So he's, she's trying to, you know, grill one of them and get some questions out of him. And this old chief comes walking by him and he goes, Oh, white man finally got around to being interested in Sasquatch. Huh? And he's like, yeah, can you tell me anything about it? I mean, they, they say that these uh, guys get to like eight feet tall. And the chief just laughs at him. And he goes, those are just the little ones. The adults are really big and you never get to see them. Yeah. Unless, unless like part of, uh, but by chance, like what happened with me where I ducked behind bushes to go check on how fast my castle is drying. And then the giant one on the other side of the dunes, where'd he go? So I took a stride out, an eight foot stride out from the tree line and stood beside that big tree with the V at the 20 foot mark. And that's the only reason I was able to gauge it because of that tree. But normally you're like, you're just left guessing. Well, I'm about but this again, big he, and I'm over. he thinks you're leaving. So he steps out yeah. to see where you went, and all of a sudden you pop up, and you're back there again. He's like, oh, crap. Kong, Mega Sasquatch. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Blaine Tyler, coming again from northeastern Ontario from the Bigfoot Barn. Um, Lord of the Sasquatch Dunes. It was a video I posted with this Meg, Mega Sasquatch, um, gigantic Sasquatch that I pulled a screen grab from a video pan. And uh, what happened was he stepped out from the tree line to see what I was doing. I guess I was casting prints coming and going from these, the other side of the quarry here. And um, I was going back and forth in my backpack to get material. So he left the tree line. And then, uh, this, gotta remember, this is midday. And, um, and when you zoom in, you can see, uh, I can see his muscle definition. He's got less hair on his chest. You can see his gray, kind of greasy skin. Um, that's what Sasquatch look like when you catch them in the open and their hollow hair and everything. They look like there's a big black out of place shadow and then, you know, until they start running, which they don't need to anymore because nobody hunts them, that, that's, that's how they get away with being spotted. But since I've seen them before, I knew what I was already looking at. Um, pretty cool. So, along with uh, Kong, I got other evidence I pulled out of there, which I'm going to make a documentary of. Multiple trackway here. Evidence of them using sticks to dig holes, scat, and everything. Here's the clip. Okay, now I'm not gonna look. I'm gonna tree line over there. I have to look to just quickly adjust. And I'm gonna walk over here. And you can see an old road that leads back to the main area where the men work and that's where they fill up I guess right there I went over there and I measured that tree where the V was kind of creepy standing over there knowing huge gigantic Sasquatch 15 feet away in the tree line or something but the, the V is at 20 feet and he's only two feet down maybe three feet at the most from the V so he's at least 17 feet tall largest Sasquatch as I said ever filmed even though it was just a kind of a Accidentally on purpose, but here's another clip. Who knows? Maybe in the future, coming in here at dawn or at dusk, I could catch one crossing right in the middle of the, of the open sandbar area and chase after it like Roger did. And then we have some more uh, supporting evidence that they're not just in the mountains out west. Right, so there's the tree. Um, took me some time to find the actual location. Um, and there's nothing there. But when I was doing a follow-up filming of it, Kong reappeared from the bush and he was watching me. And uh, I got a video of him peeking. Uh, not peeking, but watching me from the tree line there, I guess peeking. But he was ducking down to like the 10 feet height. So pretty cool. He was still there even in the follow-up, which I'm going to save for my documentary. And there's like a 16-inch print I found. Um... And again, the trackway, multiple trackways. And um, I also did catch them following me once in the opening ground. Um, didn't run away though, but I caught a juvie trying to hide behind a little sycamore branch. Pretty cool. And I'll post that when my document is <laughs> Stand still. Yeah, Maybe absolutely. you won't see me. Yeah, well, and you didn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I pan. One of the keys to getting that footage was I, I did a blind pan, on, like an intentional blind pan where I didn't want to look because I know they'll fade out if you're looking at them. 
Yeah. Or they won't move at all. But sometimes if you just like hold it over your shoulder and you turn your body or whatever, you move your hand, but keep it away from your line of sight. And sometimes they'll duck, they'll move, or they won't hide, and then you get footage. But if you're always looking right at them, they'll fade right out on you or they'll stay hidden. They won't give you anything. So that was that was planned. Um, but I, even when I was filming that guy and the other ones over there, I was nervous doing that. I wasn't nervous until I got to that sec- segment of the film where I was filming that giant guy. And then I got nervous and I hurried up. And that's like a crop. I was scared or felt the, felt the, um, I don't know, the infrasound or whatever they were doing. I felt the fear or uh, intrepidation from that giant guy on the, like, you know, 100 meters away. And he still affected me from that distance because I was pointing the camera at him. So I hurried up just instinctively because, you know, when you're, you know, you have to, you trust your gut. And then I pan back after I got away from filming him. I pan back, and that's where I pulled a, a pretty good still image because I was just holding the camera on him when I was talking about where the equipment fill up their diesel at, at the drum. But that's where I pulled the still out, if not the, the fast pan. But when I came back and was holding the camera over there, and then I got a really good still of that, and that's what I've been using and stuff. But there, as you said, you spotted ones even closer to me when, and when I did that pan. Yep. Yeah, you um, just got done looking at the little tracks that you were casting. You brought your camera up, and as you started to turn to the left, there was one really close by in this little brush, and he's taller yeah. than the brush. He's gray, and he's about nine feet tall. And again, you know, like we were talking about with Robert's uh, sunglass reflection pictures, your camera picks yeah. them up, but you don't necessarily see that they're there. Yeah, and he should have yeah. been like, Considering how close to Blaine he was and where he was at, Blaine should have easily been able to spot him. He yeah, should have been obvious. The open. Sort of yeah. Yeah, I got. I think I got pictures of that guy on other occasions. Um, just pulling off of uh, stills off my video, where he actually came up. Like where I got that footage from was a bit of a hump, where the, the sand dunes raised and stuff like that. And then I was back on the east side of it casting prints and then i go up on the hump and i'd film the mid part and then i film the west ridge and that guy came even closer another time where he was like on the hump and i was walking by and that's when I, I filmed the one the little juvie guy who just left the fence area remember i um i outlined him in green and stuff like yeah. that where he froze yeah when i walked by the hump i filmed a little bit left and that guy that you spotted was up on the hump where I was. I just took the footage of the pan. <laughs> except, yeah, except I was looking north and where I caught the juvie out in the open. And I just happened to swing the camera uh, this way, west or to my left. And that guy was right up on the far side of the hump. And in the footage, you can see there's no trees up there. Yeah. So there's something black with shoulders standing on the top of the hump. And the only trees is when you first start to go up the hump right at the lower end. And then it's like a bald uh, hump at the top. And yeah, so he came even closer to visit when I was filming another one, a, a juvie that, that, that I caught. So I'm like, wow, this isn't like the Patterson footage. And I used to talk about how much the dunes reminded me of Bluff Creek because there was tracks everywhere. Big, little two inch ones, little baby ones giant 34 inch ones your typical 18 16 inch ones i cast female um 15 inch ones and i'm like i I don't recall any other place like maybe just because it wasn't out in the open or it wasn't in public knowledge where they were being so obvious with their prints and with their trackways they didn't cut across the middle but even if they did it was hard packed by the equipment but in the the soft sand uh uh the two uh, uh, ridges, and, and maybe if I went north, I found some too. Um, the south, there's the entrance at the south, but I couldn't think of anything else except the Bluff Creek, where they were so obvious with their presence, with with prints, scat, um, tree markers, uh, shelters, messing with the equipment probably at night, and being so bold that hey, this is our area. You know, we don't care that you didn't hear digging up sand and gravel. This is still our home, and I could like you know. Maybe there was someone having um, um, activity, um, habituation activity somewhere that they, it wasn't public knowledge. But for the life of me, like, I don't remember any other place like this except my history 
and remembering that that's what Bluff Creek was like before Roger got his footage. Yeah, that's that's true. But I mean, again, you know, I've been thinking about that for years too. It's like what a gravel pit. What a weird place for them to be hanging around all the time. What is the attractant there? You know, was there like quartz there, or was you know chunks they, of salt well, like they could want to eat, or you know what what was it that they were interested in? The equipment, the guys coming and going with their dozers and all that, filling up trucks to take to road work. And then they had water and everything all around. There's two two lakes there, big ponds and a, a creek, big creek. But they would just sit on the ridges and watch the, uh, either watch me, but before me, they'd watch the equipment and the little bobcats zipping around and filling up trucks and all that. And, um, yeah, that was entertainment. And then um, – I found where the kids were playing, using sticks as tools and all that. And that was a big thing. Do you remember that? Yeah. Like, you know, 15 years ago, do they use tools? You know, are they like the chimpanzees of uh, Africa where they'll use branches to dig out termites? And I found evidence of that. And so that's pretty cool. And that, if you want to see about that, that's also going to be at the uh, Bigfoot Conference this year yeah. in Nebraska. So, So pretty awesome stuff. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing you again and uh, your wife, Lisa, that I've met yet and some other folks that are going to be there again this year and some new folks that weren't there last year. And uh, Robert Kreider is supposed to be there. Uh, we're still trying to throw a lasso around him and get him plane tickets so he actually gets there. Cause he, he is not Mr. Easy to get a hold of. <laughs> right, right. He's out, he's out in the woods, you know, fighting uh, uh, archaeologists, thieves or something. I don't know what he's up to. Yeah, he's in an active area where there's lots of competition for the evidence. And then there's also the shenanigans where they're trying to disprove the competitors, right? Yeah. Well, the majority right. so of what I, he does is treasure hunting anyway. You know, big footing thing is like a sideline for him. It's right. mostly let's go find, you know, $20 billion in gold that the conquistadors buried here 500 years ago kind of thing. Right. Yeah, me too. I'm looking for $500 million in gold too. <laughs> Where is it? I'm yeah. checking trunks of car in case there's old mafia cars stashed around in the woods. You know, maybe there's a pile of money that I can pay off my well, mortgage with, you know. As he's discovered, <laughs> if you can actually find one of these big treasure uh, caches like that, the government just swoops in and takes it anyway and you get nothing. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah government. Don't get me started, Duke. I think it was Kelly Shaw has this little meme out that said, no, education is important, but Bigfooting is important or Yeah, important or <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, people up here are pretty relaxed about it, you know. It's just, unless you're in a golf park or something, then they're like, how dare you scare the tourists? Yeah. Well, well things are out there. Again, you know, you've kind of got the edge in a, in a way because of the location, location, location. The researchers that are in better locations, if they've got their crap together and they can actually get out there and do something, have a huge edge over people that are living in crappy locations. Granted, Bigfoot are pretty much yes. everywhere, but there's some areas that definitely favor the researchers because there's so many of them and they're so calm because they're not being pressured all the time. It makes it a lot easier to get close to them. Yeah, I mean, they don't have to fight or be aggressive to hold their territory. So they just, you know, good areas like. Um, where like yeah, are, humans um, coming. I'll just walk over this next ridge. What's behind that? A thousand more next ridges. Who cares? You know, <laughs> <laughs> a thousand more lakes, a thousand yeah. more ridges. Yeah. So it's pretty good up here. You got a great area too in the mountains there. So um, I wouldn't yeah, want to be where yeah. Robin Lunsford is or, or William Lunsford is um, or. I'm not sure if Robin. I meant to say Robin and William, where they have all those poisonous snakes. Yeah, I wouldn't want. I wouldn't want to be down there. And or wild Christy pigs is. that will chase you up a tree like they did to Daniel yeah. the last time he was down there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if Robin, Christy, and uh, William all have the same kind of uh, challenges with dealing with go footing today. Maybe die from a poisonous bite snake yeah. or a snake bite. You know, what I mean, I keep the set backwards there, but get get bitten and. They got to wear special boots and all that. And then they got to yeah. watch out for packs of wild hogs yeah. or boars or whatever. 
So, yeah, I mean, wow, that's crazy. I just got to watch out for not even bears. Um, mostly uh, uh, yeah. the koi wolves or something. All like I got to worry about here hockey. is all I got to worry about is thousand pound grizzlies, mountain lions, and timber yeah. wolves. You can outrun those. <laughs> and they're all pussies. They'll stay away from you. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. For me, I mean, you don't see the wolves. You might hear them. Um, bears. There's some cougars here this way. Um, but yeah, it's mostly those koi wolves. If they see, if they get brave enough, attacking a single person hiking or walking. You know they'll 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 mob them right. Twenty of them will go after a person hiking or something, yeah. right? Or the, I've heard of them going after women. You know what I mean? Um, I've never had a problem with them, but I mean you never know, right? If they're starving or whatever, the pack gets too big. See, that's, that's why I carry my, my uh, that's why I carry my Viking broadsword with me when I'm out hiking. There's some yeah, stupid yeah, coyotes or something that, decide yeah. to jump me. It's going to be choppy chop time. They're going to die. Yeah. Yeah, I I got I carry knives and stuff, but I mean I noticed that um, you get a lot of attention here when you're just carrying a little bit of like self defense tools. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So I I carry stuff I can hide. Like I got my a nice little cool little knife, and then my walking stick actually has a spike on the end of it, like a steel spike. Yeah. My my homemade one. So I got some defense, but I mean not if something really wants you. You know, you're okay against one or two of them, but not if a pack of 20 comes at you. No. So that's what you need a broadsword for. Never leave your castle without a broadsword. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but yeah. But anyways, thanks for having me on your show. It's been a pleasure again. And like to say hi to everybody out there that follows me, follow or follows Duke's show, and all the people that come on and say hi, how's it going, Blaine, and all that. Um, I, I had a little back trouble a week or two ago and couldn't make it myself, but my wife got a chance to come on and meet everybody. That was awesome. So, yeah, I mean, uh, looking forward to seeing everybody down at the Nebraska Bigfoot Co Conference 26th, 27th uh, in April, I think. But, yep. you know, we'll be down there a couple of days early, go to the museum, make a trip out of it. It'll be awesome. And then come listen to the speakers and watch the shows and check out Duke's documentary, the best spaghetti, spaghetti uh, Western Bigfoot. Uh, how do you say it? Dude? The best spaghetti Western Bigfoot show movie that's ever been produced. That's right. Or something like that. Right? At this point, it's the only one. It is the, it is the, the greatest one. Spaghetti Western Bigfoot documentary ever made. Because right now, it's the only <laughs> Spaghetti Western Bigfoot documentary ever made. So yeah, by default, yeah, yeah. it's number one. But, you know, somebody yeah, else has one. to decide that they want to make a Bigfoot documentary of Spaghetti Western music. And until that happens, I'm holding that number one position. That's right. That's <laughs> and even right. if they do make one, they might not have as many Bigfoot in it as we do. Before me and ashton even get to nebraska we show 21 bigfoot wow that's awesome then we've got a whole pile of bigfoot that blaine found and a whole pile of bigfoot that christy found and all the stuff that rich found then we go looking for bigfoot in nebraska find one and then one comes and finds us and visits and then we go back home again and what happens after we go back home well we go back to our standard ordinary boring average lives of walking around the yes. woods Bigfoot. So you get to see a lot more Bigfoot after we leave Nebraska, too. <laughs> well, they come visit and find out how the how the, the conference went and how the local Bigfoot were. <laughs> they come <laughs> hang out with you and want to want to catch up on the news, the gossip from Nebraska, right? So, but, you know, I get a lot of people ask me, you know, yeah, we go to Alaska and you do all. I'm like, why? I can walk down the street at night and veer off into the woods and find Bigfoot. Yeah, just like you could when you're when you're at your campsite. So. I mean, other than going to like a historical site like Freeman's or or, uh, or the Patterson site, I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah. I so know. why travel? Why sp drop ten grand on a vacation when I can just spend ten minutes going up the road and then veer off into the woods? So well, but, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that's the same thing here. My favorite hot spot that we go camp at and, and spend a few days up there, that's about fifty miles from here. But if I want to go to yeah. where there's the nearest Bigfoot, for sure, where actually Mr. Big, that 12-footer, we got him on video, that's two and a half miles that way, right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got to be careful of interacting with the ones around here because then I'll be pounding on the house, pounding on the roof, knocking yeah. on the windows all the time, trying to get me to come outside. And so I always drive at least a half an hour to an hour 
just so there's some, I mean, that, 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 that's nothing to them, but it's just so I don't get the, the local ones too interested in everything going on here. Well, it's not so bad now. My kids have moved out, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I try to keep, let the ones know that are around here that they're safe. I'm not going to be going after them or even to film them or whatever they, they might think. So I, I always travel into another area so that um, the ones here with around the houses or in the fields or woods, they know they're they're safe. No one's trying to research them, and they don't you know being discovered and everything like that. What they might worry about. So I always like go further north, and they can always find me if they want. But yeah, so it really helps having good areas. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All righty. Well, thanks everybody for spending some time with us, and we're we are both looking forward to meeting all of you in person at the Nebraska Bigfoot Conference one month from now, or like. A little bit less by the time you actually see this. <laughs> a little bit more <laughs> as we're recording it. But right around a month. So make sure you all yeah. show up for it. And uh, don't forget, the usual rules apply. And in addition to that, if you can't take the heat, stay out of the Bigfoot barn. Bigfoot barn. Goodbye, everybody. When the moon hangs high on the breast of the lake, and the bite of the wind is like a slap in the face. A legend of horror lurks in the haze. It's Bigfoot. A giant of a creature, all covered with hair. As tall as a timber and strong as a bear. Y'all better not go walking out there with Bigfoot. Let's go.